Today, our topic is about Islam and Christianity conflict. The conflict between Christians and Islam. Christians and Muslim conflict and the division that exists in the world today. When we look at the Quran that was written about 1,400 years now, and then we look at the Bible, the Old Testament is about 3,200 years now, and the New Testament is about 2,000 years. These three books are supposed to be in a continuum which means from the Old Testament to the Gospels and to the Quran. But there is division between Islam and Christianity and also Islam and Judaism and also Christianity and Judaism. So for over 1,400 years when Islamic religion was established, they have been at loggerheads with the Christians. Why? People of the same source. People worshipping the same God are now divided. And they are loggerheads with each other. At any moment, one will attack the other. The, the Christian Muslim dichotomy is a serious situation. It can lead to a serious conflict and derail any process towards peace in the world. It is time for us to find out how best we can live in peace, how best we can live with each other. So we have to find out any means or any process to ensure that Christians and Muslims are together and understand that they are worshiping the same God. And that will bring some relative peace and probably an absolute peace. Because this is a serious conflict and a division that has been created has been lasted for 1,400 years and is going to continue, which means we have to study these issues carefully and see how best we can integrate these two and how best they can sit down and dialogue to bring understanding among them. Now, as a result of this, we will subject it to the area of conflict and then find out what actually determine the conflict between the Muslims and the Christians. In the first place, are we going to say this conflict was caused by ideas According to Hegel, social conflict is always caused by ideas, the consciousness of man. So do we say the Trinian differences have divided the Muslims and the Christians? Then also, there is another school in the evolutionary theory and that is Karl Marx. Marx said, all social conflict is not determined by the consciousness of man, but the being, which means the Islamic Christian conflict could be caused by materialism, 
by material existence. There is also a third component of the conflict theory by Dr. Vinet Nana Asante Kankam de Costa. To him, if a conflict brings an everlasting division, then that conflict is caused by sexual gratification and this differential model. So which of these three are we going to say cause the Islamic Christian conflict so that people can sit down and dialogue? If the Pope is meeting the Caliph or the bishops are meeting the Malams, what issue are they going to discuss so that they can dialogue to settle their differences? and establish peace among them and bring peace to the world. So we will go into the books carefully and see what is actually causing the division because most of the time people are giving some kind of side ideas and people use it to fight. In most cases, like recently, we heard about Boko Haram in Nigeria, sometimes conflict in Egypt, or at close. You can see some Muslims attacking some Christians, and to explain it, we don't use the book to explain, but rather we go outside the box. So we're going to look into the box and see the difference between these groups. Is it doctrine which is dividing the Muslims and the Christians? In terms of doctrinal differences, looking into the Quran and the Bible, there is always an issue about the sonship of Jesus Christ. Secondly, there is also some division or differences in the concept of the Holy Trinity. And then also, there is differences in the crucifixion of Christ. And finally, there is also the differences of who is the greatest of all the messengers of God. So we will go into the Quran and the Bible to determine what they say. To look at it whether it is actually the differences of doctrine that divide these two. Or the doctrines were used to assuage the minds of the people. That the people could, can do anything without even thinking to know what is actually the determining factor. So looking at it from the Quran, we could see that talking about the sonship of Christ, this has been an old argument which had existed within the Christian circle before even Muhammad was born. 300 years before Muhammad was born, that was 325 AD, the Christians themselves met in Nicaea to discuss about the ideological differences or the Trinian differences about the sonship of Christ. What did they say at that place? There were two groups of people, the Arians and the Andalusians. Arian was a Libyan who was educated in the Greek. And Andalusus was also from Egypt. So more or less these two African intellectuals were debating among each other about the sonship of Christ. So in the course of it, when they met, Aru's position was this. If the son is a real son, 
He said, Then the Father may exist before the Son. Therefore, the Divine Father must have existed before the Divine Son. Therefore, there was a time when the Son did not exist. As a result, He is a creature. The greatest indeed, and the oldest of all creatures, and himself a God. But still, created there, like all creatures of the essence of the substance, which previously had not existed. So this theoretical position or doctrinal position of Arius indicates that if he was the real son of God, then God might have existed before the eternal son. So the two could not coexist. So this had been a conflict in the Christian religion that was settled in the Nazian conference in 325 AD. So from this point, when we look at it, it looks as if Muhammad was also taking sides, or the Quran was taking sides. Whether it was Aryan position or Andenisu's position, who said now the, the father and the son coexist at the same time. So we are going to read from the Quran the position of the Quran about the sonship of Christ. We are reading from Abba Gara, chapter 2, 117. Alam, chapter 6, 101 to 102. Yunis, 1069. Al 815. Al Anam, 619. Mariam, 1980, 89 to 93. Al Mumini, 23 to 92. Al Zuma, 39, 5. And Al Safat, 37, 150 to 160. And Al Aklas, 112, 1 to 5. So we will read to know the position of the Quran about the sonship of Christ. And we are reading from the Quran, the most authentic translation. So it is written, and they say, Allah has taken to himself a son. Holy is he, nay, everything in the heavens and earth belongs to him. To him are all obedient. And they hold the gems to be partners with Allah, although he created them. And they falsely ascribe to him sons and daughters without any knowledge. Holy is he, and exalted for above what they attribute to him. The originator of the heavens and earth, how can he have a son. He has no consult. And when he has created everything and has all things, they say, Allah has taken into himself a son. <clears throat> Holy is he. He is self-sufficient. To him belongs whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever in the earth. You have no authority for this. Do you say against Allah what you know not? And that it may warn those who say Allah has taken into himself a son. And he is supreme over his servants. And he is the wise and the all aware. And they say, the gracious God has taken into himself a son. 
Assuredly, you have done a most monstrous thing. The heavens might well nigh burst thereat. Mountains fall down in places because they ascribe a son to the gracious God. Whereas it becomes not the gracious God to take into himself a son. Allah has not taken into himself any son. Nor is there any other God along with him. In that case, if God will have taken away what he has created. And some of them will surely have dominated over others. Glory, five be Allah. Above all, which they attribute to him. If Allah had desired to take to himself a son, he could have chosen whom he pleased out of what he created. Holy is he. He is Allah, the most supreme. How ask them whether thy Lord has daughters, whether they have sons? Did we create the angels, females, while they were witness? Now surely, it is one of their fabrications that they say Allah has begotten children. And they are certainly liars. Has he chosen daughters in preference to sons? What is the matter with you? How judge ye? Will you not then reflect? Or have you a clear authority? Then produce your book. If you are truthful. And they accepted the blood relationship between him and the genes. While the jinn themselves know that they will be brought before God for judgment. Holy is Allah and free from what they attribute to him. The name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful said, He is Allah, the one Allah, the independent and besought of all. He begat not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. This is the position of the Quran about the sonship of Jesus Christ. The Quran has then denied Jesus Christ as not the Son of God. We will also go into the Bible the gospel to see what is being said about Jesus. So the Quran said Jesus was not the son of God, equally like Arus who said if he was a true son of God, he would not coexist with the Father. But here the Quran rejects completely that he was not the son of God. But before we go ahead, let it be clear. The Quran states that the Torah and the Gospel are true revealed books of God in addition to the Quran. So if the Quran is the true revealed book of God and the Gospel is also the true revealed book of God as well as the Torah as a, a revealed book of God then we can say that the three, the three must be in a continuum. We can make reference to each of them to make sure that we are in the right path to know whether these ideas is just to assuage the minds of the people or it is the real thing to believe. In the Quran, God spoke to Muhammad. And said, we recite unto you, Muhammad, that you are one of the messengers. Nobody has to challenge because Allah has spoken. And Muhammad himself called himself 
the messenger of God, the messenger of Allah, we don't have to challenge him because he was a prophet. And if God spoke, he is also God. And we have to accept what God has said without any challenge. If it is so, we will go also into the gospel. If God ever said something about Jesus in terms of the sonship of Christ. Now it came about when all people were baptized that Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven and said, Thou art my beloved Son. In thee am well pleased. This is the gospel. God has spoken from above, calling Jesus his beloved Son. We shall also read further. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid. As they entered the cloud, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So here, God has spoken. Do we have to challenge? We don't have to challenge. And I don't think Muhammad will ever challenge God and say what God has said is not true. Then let's also see what Jesus said about himself. For Muhammad said, he is the messenger of Allah. And Allah confirmed it also say, we recite unto you, you are one of the messengers. Nobody has to challenge. So now we have heard from God saying Jesus was and is his son. And now let's see what Jesus also said about himself. By taking it from the Bible. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, where have, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it are you looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? What house was he? He was in the temple. The temple is not the house for Joseph. And Joseph was a sociological father. So what father was Jesus talking about? We shall continue. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paretic, I say, rise and take up your stretcher and go home. So he called himself the son of man. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heavens and earth, thou that hide these things from the wise and intelligent. And I thus reveal to the babies, Yes, Father, for that it was well, pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son to reveal him. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you, saying, Father, if thou art willing, remove this car from me, not my will, but thy will be done. So over here, Jesus is still calling God 
my father. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Yes, I am. And they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And Jesus crying out with a crowd voice. In a, in a loud voice he said, Father, unto thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from high. See that ye do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that your angels in heaven continuously behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me, and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people standing around, I said it. They may believe that thou dost send me. Now, when you look at this, Allah has said Jesus was and is his son. And Jesus himself called God Father, and he considered himself the Son of Man. In this way, how can Muhammad, who respected Jesus very well, denounce what God has said and denounce what Jesus has said about himself? Oh, this is just mere doctrinian Play. It's like a game play. If we believe you, Muhammad, when God speaks to you, then we have to believe Jesus when God spoke about him. If we believe you when you say you are the messenger of God, then let us also believe him for saying that he was the son of man. Because all of you are prophets. And you have the same message for the world. Why the difference? Why one cannot accept the other? And these doctrinian differences 
will not create any social structure but just for a debate. Was the Quran really supporting the existing ideological differences in the Christian religion? Or in reality, they read the gospel and was able to find whether Jesus never called himself the Son of God. Jesus said he was the Son of God. And even if all people on this earth are saying they know God, no one will say, I know heavens, sometimes on the earth here, more than Lucifer. It is known that the Satan was once with God, so he knew or knows whatever is in heaven. So at one point, he tested Jesus and said, if you are the son of man, turn this stone into bread. And Jesus rebuked him. He took Jesus further and said, if you are the son of man, Throw yourself, and it is written. Look at the devil quoting the Bible, and it is written that he will let the angels come and hold you, that your feet will not strike in stone. That's why he knew that there is a son of God in heaven, and he was testing Jesus. He knew the son of man, what he can do, and he was instructing him to do it. But Jesus didn't want that kind of challenge. So he has seen it. Even the ordinary spirits walk around and said, Why do you have to come here, Jesus? The Son of the living God. Depart from us. So all these are testimonies to prove that Jesus was the Son of God. So why the Quran? only says he was not the son of God. If Jesus said he is the son of God, and the Quran says he is not, then Jesus was a liar, and not the Isa. Now is a liar? If God has said, this is my beloved son, and you say now that he is not your son, then you say that God is also a liar. On the part of Jesus, God has spoken. He also has spoken. Is God and Jesus himself lying to the people? It's not the people who are saying that Jesus was the son of God. He himself said it. And anything that the prophets have said must be accepted by other prophets. Whatever Moses wrote, Jesus did not condemn anything, but he came to fulfill it. So it is up to Muhammad also to come and fulfill what Jesus has left over. If it is so, then there is a continuation of the prophetic line from all the prophets from Moses all unto, or we can say from Abraham unto Moses, then unto all the prophets, into Jesus and into Muhammad. Then we will say that is a continuation of God's work. And the words will flow systematically and there will be no conflict. So in this way, this idea has an answer and has a solution. If the Christians can sit down with the Muslims and discuss, all these doctrinal differences will be moved away. And the real thing that divides them, we will know later. The next doctrine the Trinian differences is about the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity concept had existed long time ago, before Muhammad was born. It has been challenged by other people, and still it goes on to the time Muhammad came into existence with his Islamic movement. And the Quran goes further also in rejecting the Holy Trinity. This Holy Trinity conflict 
means is God three in one? Is God has elements which are inseparable and indispensable in him? His word and his spirit. When we read from the Bible, especially from Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 2, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless, and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. The spirit of God was moving along without God the Father. So the spirit of God moved on the surface of the water without the Father. Can the spirit be a channel of God? Now, the second point is, God has word. He spoke the word, and the word will go out and create. When he speaks out the word, he never says anything again. Until the work finishes his work and comes back to him, then he speaks it out again to bring about creation. Now, considering the word of God, we will read from the Bible in John 1, 1, 15. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He came into his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man by God, so here it says, in the beginning was the word of God. So nobody knows the form of the word of God. Nobody knows the form of the spirit of God until it came to a point that the word was incarnate to become human. Then we know God's word, the form in the form of Jesus. Now in Genesis, how did God create Jesus? Jesus was not created because according to Muhammad, Jesus was the word given unto Mary. And so as we know how Adam and Eve were created by God, from the dust. Here we see that Jesus was not created in that way, but was born naturally. And if Jesus was a messenger, then we would have known that all the prophetic aspect of his birth would not have been Existing in many of the books, especially reading from Isaiah. But here, 
there is always a disagreement whether Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are one. That is the position of the Christians. So what is the position of the Islamic Quran? And going to the Islamic Quran, we are going to read from Anisha 4172. Oh, people of the book, exceed not the limit in your religious or in your religion, and say not of Allah anything but the truth. Verily, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah and the fulfillment of his word, which he sent down to Mary and a mercy from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. And say not they are free, this it. It will be better for you, verily Allah is the only one God. Far is it from his holiness that he should have a son. To him belongs whatever is in heavens and whatever is on the earth. And sufficient is Allah as a guardian. So here it says, Allah did not have a son. This doesn't have a word. And so where did it come from? The Quran still rejects the Trinity concept. And we will read from Maida, chapter 5, verses 74-75. And they are surely these believers who say, Allah is the third of the three. Why? Well, there is no God but one God. And if they do not desist from what they say, a gracious punishment shall surely befall those of them that believe. Would they not then turn to Allah and beg him for forgiveness? Why Allah is most forgiving, merciful. So the Quran have taken sides of the Holy Trinity concept. But if Jesus is not an essence of God, why is it that all the books accepted that Jesus was taken into heaven? Even the book of Barnabas, in page 273 to verses 2 to 1, it says this, Then before their eyes, the four angels carried him up into heavens. The book of Barnabas is one book that has been written completely at variance to what most Christians believe. But even that he also accept that Jesus was taken direct into heaven. If he was not the son of man, why would he be thrown anywhere on earth? So it is evidently that the Trinity concept, if we are to argue, will never end. And that's how to assuage the minds of the people because Muhammad said God's word was sent to Mary so his word is part of him and he became flesh so if God's word was brought unto Mary that manifested into Jesus Christ then in the beginning that God was created, he used words to create. And so there is no much debate in this area about the Holy Trinity. 
God has channels. And God's channels can be the Word and the Spirit. Through these channels, God functions. If we say God has no channels, how he functions through his word. In the beginning, God says something. Let us create man in our own likeness. Why did he use plural? Let us create man. And then once he also said the man has become almost, has become one like us. Why did he use us? Is God having a wife or who is God referring to as us? The same way in the Quran, God always speaks to Muhammad in plural terms. We recite unto you. So why God didn't say, I recite unto you? But rather he says, we recite unto you in plural. Let us make man in our own likeness in plural. Whom is God making that decisions with? Not the angels. He created the angels. And he cannot make major decision of creating man with the angels. So whom was God referring to? If not his word and his spirit. That can be in the form that we actually don't know. But in the metaphysical world, it can be explained by the prophets. So the Trinitarian conflict is not a serious conflict. That in the box, it can be said. And it can assuage the minds of the people to do things that we actually don't understand. Now another polemics is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Was Jesus Christ actually killed or he was not? Was he crucified or he was not? This has been a problem between the Bible and the Quran. Is it the actual fact? Which people have to believe? Or is it just ideological differences that is used to assuage the minds of the people? Let us look into it. Was well, Jesus actually killed? And we're going to read from the Quran version about Jesus' crucifixion. We will read from Al Amran 3.32.56, 3.38. Al Nisa 4158 Al Bagra 273 Ameda 5111 and Al Mumani 2351 and here it goes and they plan and Allah also plan and Allah is the best plan when Allah said, O oh Jesus, I will cause thee to die a natural death, and will exalt thee to myself, and will clear thee from the charges of those who disbelieve, and will place those who follow thee above those who disbelieve. Until the day of resurrection, then to me shall be your return, and I will judge between you concerning that wherein you differ. So which means Jesus was not crucified. And if you are slain in the cause of Allah or you die, surely forgiveness from Allah and mercy shall be better than what they hoard. 
And they are saying, we did kill the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Would I they slay him not, nor crucify him? But he was made to appear to them like one crucified. And those who differ therein are suddenly in a state of doubt about it. They have no definite knowledge thereof, but only follow a conjuncture. And they did not convert their conjuncture into a certainty. And we say, smit him. Smart him with some of it. Does Allah bring up the dead to life and show you his potent so that ye may understand? When Allah will say, O oh Jesus, son of Mary, remember my favor upon thee and upon thy mother. When I strengthen thee with the spirit of holiness, to that thou dost speak to the people in the cradle and in the middle age. And when I taught thee the book and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel, and when thou dost function a creation out of clay in the likeness of a bird, by my command, then thou dost breathe into a new spirit and it became a swollen being by my command. And thou dost heal the night blind and the leprous by my command. And when thou dost raise the dead by my command, and when I restrain the children of Israel from putting thee to death, when thou dost come to them with clear signs, and those who disbelieve from among them said, There is nothing but clear deception. And we made the son of Mary and his mother a sign and gave them a refuge on an elevated land of green valleys and springs of raining water. Springs of running water in Kashmir. So from that bad statement, Jesus died naturally and was buried. So was Jesus buried naturally? According to the Quran, Allah planned. So he was not killed. <laughs> then it was also said in the Quran, he was, a, he was made to appear like the one. So they did not kill Jesus. Now, if you say Jesus was not killed, Jesus was not killed. It means he wasn't crucified. So all the stories told about Jesus was a host, according to the Quran. The people did not kill him. If they kill him, then that would have been a different story. So the people did not kill him. This is what the Quran is saying. But did the people actually kill Jesus? When Jesus was taken to be crucified, he met his mother on the way. Are we saying the mother didn't even know that that was not her son? For her to go home and rejoice that her son is not the one being taken. Also, after crucifixion, Jesus was laid on the mother's lap and prepare him for burial. So did the mother also not know at that point 
that Jesus was not the one on her lap. Jesus also spoke to the apostles standing by with the mother. So the apostles also did not know that that was not the Jesus they have known. Were they all tricked? But in all, Jesus performed miracles. The Quran said Jesus was given the power to breathe into an object to become a swollen being, a living being. If Jesus was given the power to create, then what God can raise him up from death is a problem. And also, <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> Jesus was made to appear like the one. Does it mean that somebody was killed? Yes, from that statement, it means somebody was killed. And to the statement, it means it wasn't Jesus. But rather, God has made somebody to appear like him to be killed. If you say this, you are saying that God was committing murder by giving somebody to be killed and not his son. So he has committed murder. Does it mean that God is so limited that he could not allow his son to be killed and for him to raise him up to reveal that resurrection really do exist? These are some of the questions we can put forward so that the Christians and the Muslims can sit down and dialogue to pull away their doctrinal differences, make it clear and clean for everybody to know the truth and follow the truth. For it is said that the truth shall save. So if we know the truth, the way is clear for everybody to worship God in its real essence. Now let's look at the Christian side. Jesus uttered a loud crowd. In a loud crowd, and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, said the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. When Jesus made a loud cry, that's what happened. So Jesus is really the one crucified. So on the cross that he spoke to the parents, spoke to the apostles, all came out to be nothing. But we know God is all in all, all powerful, all knowing, sufficient, independent. Allah can do anything. Therefore, allowing Jesus to be killed for him to raise him up is easy for Allah. So he won't play tricks. And the Quran also indicated that God planned so that Jesus will not be killed. But rather somebody else was made to appear like Jesus. That is something that we have to be looked at. And be able to differentiate between the two. The gospel and the Quran version about Jesus Christ. Because Muhammad will never tell any lie about Jesus. Because he believed another Isa was unto God proper. And therefore, he would not say anything of that nature. But why is it written in the Quran in such a way that everything has not been refined, but in its raw form, to say that Jesus was not crucified? Now, there is also another 
polemics in the Quran and the Bible. Who is the greatest of all the messengers of God? These are ideas to assuage the minds of the people so that people will not know what, they, what actually differentiate them so that they cannot dialogue to bring peace among them. So who is the greatest of all the prophets? I think here the Quran has an answer. And we shall read from Al Baqarah, chapter 2, 227 to 237. Al Baqarah has the solution. And let's listen. These are the signs of Allah. We recite them unto thee with truth. Surely thou art one of the messengers. These messengers have we exalted some of them above others. Among them there are those who Allah spoke. And some of them he exalted by degrees of rank. And we have give, we gave Jesus, son of Mary, clear proofs and strengthened him with the spirit of holiness. And if Allah has so willed, those that came after them will not have fought with one another. After a clear son had come to them, but they did not disagree. Of them were some who believe, and of them were some who disbelieve. And if Allah has so willed, they will not have fought with one another. But Allah does what He desires. Here it means these messengers have been ranked by degrees. And here they give testimony to Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. It reveals that Jesus has been raised above all. And if we know, there will be no conflict. There will be no disbelief. He has been raised above all, according to Abba Garah. So why do we say, this is the greatest person? Who this is the greatest one? Is it Moses to the Jews? Or Jesus to the Christians? And Muhammad to Islamic? Who is the greatest? The Quran has come out clear to prove who is the greatest in Abu Ghraib. That Jesus was given the spirit of holiness and had been raised above all. If we know, we later generation will not argue. So that is the point that Jesus is raised above all. And if we read also from the Bible, during the time of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was about to baptize Jesus, the people wanted to know whether he was the Messiah. And he said he was not. But the one who is coming is greater than he. And he has even no right to untie his shoes. So John, whose name is Yahya in Islam, have said Jesus is above all. And Muhammad in Abu Ghraib has proven that Jesus has been ranked above all. So there is no argument in that. So we say doctrine and differences is not the major cause that brought the division and conflict between Islam and Christianity. If not, what else? Let's go further into the school of conflict to find out what has divided the Muslims and Christians that they can come out to dialogue to bring peace among them. And the school of conflict Taking it from Marxist perspective, the Islamic Christian conflict did not come as a result of material conflict. 
Because from the beginning, even though there were crusadic wars, but the conflict came to an end. So even if there were any material conception, it was a short lived and did not go further. And therefore, materialism is not a major point of dividing Islam from Christianity. But one point we will look at to see the real division between the Muslims and the Christians is from sexual gratification and its differential models. Before Muhammad was born, the whole of Middle East, North Africa, unto Europe, have accepted Christianity. The Pauline sexual model has penetrated into the society. And with the Jesuit Pauline models, all the members of the church, the top ranking, the priests, the bishops, the archbishop, the cardinals, or unto pope, should not participate in any sexual act. All the priests, all the monks, then the sisters that went to convents were also not allowed to participate in any gratification. Then after that, from the kings to the bottom of the society, everybody is unto one man, one woman marriage. And there was no divorce. This has been instituted by the religion. So at this point, the religion took to itself to celebrate weddings. It made marriage more expensive and complex. Did Jesus establish monogamy marriage? Jesus never preached anything about monogamy or polygamy. Never made any comparisons. It was only one time that he made a reference from the Bible and he said that's why the man will leave his mother and father and cling himself to his wife and the two are one and no longer two but one here he wasn't talking about polygamy or monogamy he wasn't condemning any of the sexual models and jesus himself never celebrated any wedding he did not put people together in the church or in his movement. But it was later on that religion took to itself to initiate weddings. So when Muhammad came, that was what was existing. And we look at him, what he look at it. What is he going to say about this social arrangement? This will be the greatest revolution of Muhammad. And how did the revolution come about? And we're going to read from the Quran how he initiated his revolution that brought a complete break between Islam and Christianity. And if Christians today want to dialogue with the Muslims, this is the area they have to dialogue. Because it is the most complex of all the issues. The Trinian differences, even if it causes division, that is short-lived. It can be taken away. Materialism is also a short-lived. But <clears throat> sexual gratification and its differential models brings a lasting division. Brings a lasting schism. So, what did Muhammad also say about this arrangement? The relationship between men and women. We will read from Anisa. Because 
after the battle of Uhund, so many nobles were killed in the opposing side, and they have left behind beautiful women, beautiful daughters. And all these generals were interested in getting these beautiful women and beautiful daughters. So they have to go to Muhammad and make inquiries and ask. So reading from Anisa chapter 4, verse 4. And if you fear that you will not be fair in dealing with the orphans, then marry of women as may be agreeable to you. Two, three, four. And if you fear you will not deal justly, then marry only one of what your right hand possesses. That is the nearest way for you to avoid injustice. That is Muhammad's answer to the general that went to him to ask how many women could they take? And he said two, three, four. And since that time, it has become a belief that every man has the right to marry up to four, according to the prophet. So in Islamic religion, Muhammad has come to establish polygamy. Once again, as it has existed from Abraham's time through Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Esau, David, Solomon, he has brought it back to the people. That is the very argument Jesus had had with the Jews. So he instituted polygamy in the society. Then came his second revolution. After establishing polygamy, so polygamy has been accepted in the Islamic world. And the Christians have not. The second revolution of Muhammad came. And the second revolution was to destroy any sexual gratification model that the Christians have established. And here he goes. In Al Nisa 4 21 27. And if you desire to take one wife in place of another, you have given one of them a treasure. Take not off thereof. Will you take it by lying and with manifest sinfulness? And how can you take it when one of you? has been alone with one another. And they, women, have taken from you. Here he was talking about divorce. Divorce is something Jesus has said several times that it shouldn't happen. But Muhammad was going ahead with it. Taking from Abagara 2227 to 237. And from those who vow abstinence from their wives, the maximum period of waiting is four months. Then if they go back from, now, from vow, surely Allah is most forgiving and merciful. And if they decide upon divorce, then surely Allah is all hearing and all knowing. And the divorced women shall wait concerning themselves for three causes. And if it is not lawful for them that they conceal what Allah has created in their wombs. If they believe in Allah and the last day, and their husbands have the greatest right to take them back during that period, provided they desire reconciliation. And they, especially the women, have rights similar to those of men over them in equality. 
But men have a rank above them, and Allah is mighty and wise. He was instituting divorce in the Arab world. There are other rules concerning divorce. And so Muhammad came to establish polygamy and establish divorce. Jesus said, what God has put together, nobody should cause asunder. Nobody should separate them except immorality on the part of the woman, except unchastity on the part of the woman. But if the woman has not caused any of this, then you have no right to divorce. But here, divorce is accepted. Divorce and polygamy will change the social structure of the society. And that is the fundamental revolution of Islamic religion against Christianity. Therefore, he established paternal authority. Because Muhammad said, reading from Al Nisa, chapter 4, verses 35. Men are guardians over women because Allah has made some of them excel others. And because they, men, spend of their wealth, so virtually, virtuous women are those who are obedient and guard the service or the secrets of their husbands with a large protection. And as for those on whose part you fear disobedience, admonish them and leave them alone in their bed and chastise them. Then if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Surely Allah is high and great. When you say chastise them, which means you can cause a bodily harm by beating the woman. And that was a condition to make the men superior over the women. And so men have been given the power to rule the women as the original Torah have said in the first or in the first book Genesis that the man will rule over the woman. So that is a connection here that Muhammad was bringing. So that was revolutionary of making the women equal to men. And so because the men spend their money on women, so they have the rank over the women. Is it why sometimes in some societies like United States and other countries, women don't want to spend their money on men? If a man is receiving 60000 a year, he can take care of a woman and two children. But if a woman is receiving one twenty to 200000 she's not prepared to spend a dime on a husband. And so if a woman tries to take care of a husband, probably within a short time, all the neighborhood, everybody will hear that the husband is a lazy husband. But does it mean that if the women share their wealth, would there be equality in Islam? The men have a higher rank than the women. And so the men were so happy when this was established by the prophet. Now, when we look further into the religion, they want to see how the social structure should be maintained. How do we maintain the family? People were at war. So now they have to come to the prophet to ask him what they have to do with the spoils of war. When they asked him, this is what the Quran answered. From Al-Anfar, chapter 1, 
2 to 3. It says this, they are the concerning the spoils of war. Say, the spoils belongs to Allah and the Messenger. So fear Allah and set things right among yourselves and obey Allah and His Messenger if you are believers. True believers are only those whose hearts tremble when the name of Allah is mentioned and when His songs are recited to them. They increase their faith, and who put their trust in the Lord are those to be the real servants of God. So, over here, this is the deal. If Christians will have anything to dialogue with the Muslims to bring peace, they should look into the sexual gratification model which has structured the society differently from each other. In Islamic religion, polygamy is accepted, divorce is accepted, men dominate women, and at the same time they say the spoils of war is for Allah and His Messenger. But we know that Allah is sufficient. He does not need any spoils of war. If he is sufficient and doesn't even need a son, how does he need spoils of war? But these have been written for us to know. Who are getting the spoils of war? The generals. So if those people are getting it, then the ordinary people can go to war and die for something else. Sometimes it is believed also that if you defend the faith and even if you die you are going to meet virgins in heaven to marry some say 72 virgins some say nine virgins whatever they put it which means you are going to heaven to get married but there's no marriage in heaven so it is on earth here the difference between the Christians and the Muslims is in the way men and women relationship have been structured. That's why to some extent, if you go to some countries where women are monopolized and controlled, they sometimes circumcise them, enable to control them. So that is the issue. The control of the women is the dividing line between the Christians and the Muslims. If they have any dialogue, this is where they can dialogue. And if they can agree to give us the most sacrosanct sexual gratification model, there will be peace all over the world. This is the issue. And so, we urge Christian leaders and Muslim leaders to get together to solve these differences so that we can get things straight. Because we all want to know God, the true God, so that we worship God and God only. Therefore, we have to make the, these differences settle in order to ensure a lasting peace. The ideological conflict will come to an end. The material conflict will come to an end. But sexual gratification, conflict and division stays forever. So how do we solve it? It's up to the leaders of these two religions. Thank you everybody.